Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to IADC's webinar today about um, the financing for sustainable water related infrastructure projects. Um, this is going to be a one hour webinar, um, which is one of two. We're going to have the first today. The second is going to take place on the 23rd of November. Today, we're going to focus on the more general issues related to the green financing of um, water related infrastructure, marine or freshwater, or maybe we're going to focus on the financing of sustainable projects in this area, depending on, uh, on what uh, kind of attitude you would like to take to this issue in the presence of two guests whom I'm going to introduce shortly to you. Um, as I said, this is going to be a one hour session. Uh, in that one hour, we're going to ask you a couple of questions, but mainly we're going to conduct the session as a discussion between our two guests with some questions from my side, some questions for you to answer. So let me immediately um, introduce to you our two guests for today. Um, on the left side of my screen, but I don't know how that happens in your screen, we have Arjan Hydra of Vital Ports. Arjan is the author of the report Financing Sustainable Marine and Freshwater Infrastructure Projects. And um, in your CV, um, Arjan, you say your work consists of connecting engineering, financial and governance perspectives into sound and sustainable investment planning. Is that correct? Well, you, you could you could say so. And uh, if I may uh, correct uh, one other thing, I'm not the uh, uh, only author of the report. So we worked on this with an entire team. So lots of credits go to the other ones just to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The record. OK, good, good. Um, you 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 composed this report together with the team. Um, what's the main purpose of it? Well, actually, we had uh, high ambitions of to uh, to push forward uh, in the in building this bridge between the uh, operational, technical sector and the financial sector. But the main purpose uh, it should play is to to support the conversation between those two sectors. So that's actually uh, what we found out during the process that there's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, unknowns uh, about uh, our sector, uh, what can be done. So uh, mainly having a report uh, to build from. OK, we're going to go more deeply into the findings in the report, uh, of course, in, in the course of this session. But before we do so, I'd like to introduce our second guest, Reinhard Wiersma. He is the program manager for climate adaptation with a dredging company Van Oort. Um, I think, Reinhard, we can safely say that you're a man from the world of practice. You've worked for over 25 years in various roles of managing all kinds of infrastructure and development, uh, development uh, projects. Um, your current role, um, what, what, how does, how would do, should we interpret that? Um, currently, I'm uh, responsible for the climate adaptation program within Van Oort. Uh, we have a team of five people within Van Oort, and we try to find new business, uh, helping clients uh, in climate adaptation and uh, focusing on uh, coastal protection uh, mainly. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we try to find in places like in Africa, we try to find coastlines which are weak. And we're trying to find uh, clients and we're trying to find finance and see how we can bring the solutions which we already do for about 150 years how we can bring them to uh, other countries uh, so that is in a nutshell what we do okay and so you're, you're not focusing so much on implementing the strategic development goals that's not your your angle to sustainability your angle is where if we have a, sustainable, a significant rise of the sea level, will we have issues and how can we prevent those issues? Is that a correct way of representing no, things? I think, I think that's a bit too short. I think uh, mm. I think our purpose also is to, uh, I think Van Oort, our purpose is create a better world for future generations. Um, and, and then let's say we have a large sustainability program, which we are one of the uh, things of. And, and we are, yeah, our SDG is uh, climate action. But we also look at, uh, let's say, how, how can we do it more sustainable? How can we create biodiversity? Can we use mangroves? Can we use building with nature? So we are actually also very much focused on, on bringing these green solutions to the, uh, uh, let's say, to the world. Right. So in, in the projects, you immediately also incorporate some of the things that have already been discovered in the course of time over the past maybe 15 to 20 years, sometimes a bit yeah, every, every here and there, a bit longer. Um, and and offer nature-based solutions. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, great. So that roughly sets the scene. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you will hear a lot more from our two guests. But before we um, we go more deeply into the issues, we would like to have a bit of an idea um, which is useful for the perspective that we can take in the course of this webinar of who we have as an audience. So Ria, Ria van Leeuwen, who you see uh, mentioned on the screen, but who's present in the background, and she's our technical support. Um, could you um, show us the first poll question, please? Now, depending on your version of Teams, you may see the poll question directly on your screen as a pop-up. You may also see it in your chat box. So if you don't see it as a pop-up, please check your chat box, and then you can uh, answer the question then and there. And this first question is really to try and uh, and see what is the background of the participants. Um, professional background, and then afterwards we have a second question to see what is the main reason why you are taking part in this seminar. But let's have a, a view first of who we have here, which is a good moment for a sip of water. And... <clears throat> All right, the number of responses is gradually increasing. We have about half of the people represent dredging companies, and then about one third are consultants, and we have two people from NGOs. Okay, so we're um, not having any representatives of investment or the financial world. We're also not having any representatives of uh, clients like public entities and um, clients of dredging services. Um, second lobby question, second uh, poll question, Ria, if you, uh, if you would be kind enough, is what is the reason why you would like to take part or why you are taking part in this, uh, in this webinar? So that second poll is now also live again, uh, depending on your version of Teams either as a pop-up or in the uh, chat box. And here you can give more than one option. So you can tick as many boxes as you like. Okay, let's see, we have 11 responses, so a couple of uh, answers still coming in. And here we see the, yeah, you can see it in the in the chat box as well, can't you, Aryan and, uh, and Reinhardt, or maybe on the pop-up. There's a, quite a equal distribution between all of the reasons with the only one which is uh, a bit less, is to learn what policies would benefit the funding of green solutions. All of the others are uh, more or less equal. Well, um, I think to hear examples of successful, sustainable and marine freshwater infrastructure projects. So let, let's do that. Let's hear about something maybe, Aryan that you have found or Reinhard that you have um, practiced. What, what is an example of uh, where you have a project which is successful, and which has been funded in a green way. Shall I go first? Uh, go ahead, Arjun. Yeah, you go first, yeah. Well, in, in the research we did with the uh, team on uh, uh, good cases, uh, we uh, encountered many, many good cases, which could be uh, examples of green projects, uh, nature-based projects. Uh, for instance, go to the website of uh, EcoShape uh, or uh, many other publications. But linking this to the finance uh, side, uh, that is quite rare. Uh, usually you see that public entities just invest straightforward in these kinds of uh, projects, and there's not so much of a finance component in this. But perhaps one of the most um, uh, outstanding uh, examples, uh, a project where I used to work in uh, quite some time ago, is the uh, Meuse project in the Netherlands, uh, particularly the Grensmaas. Mm -hmm. There you see we had uh, flooding uh, problems in uh, the Netherlands, so uh, widening of the river uh, to prevent uh, floodings was uh, one of the purposes, but it was on equal foot with uh, nature development. So 
natural environment, a wider riverbed, uh, it's one of the other uh, purposes, uh, of a, it was a combined purpose, and it was all paid by the revenues from uh, sand and the gravel from this uh, project. So it was paid back in, in such a way, so there was a kind of a business uh, model to it. And if you happen to, uh, to get, uh, come there these days, it's uh, about finished, this project. It's a beautiful place, a lot of natural area, and actually uh, with floodings uh, just here in uh, the summertime, it uh, also served its uh, purpose of uh, flood protection. So I think that's one of the great examples at this moment. Aside okay. from the many other great nature-based and sustainable examples we see in practice, but linking this to a financial... Or yeah, because that, that, of course, is the specific angle we're choosing yeah. here. Um, Reino, do you have an example of a project where the funding was also somehow or other raised in a different way involving what is called green capital, even though, even though we may, may need to say more about what green capital actually is, uh, either in this uh, webinar or in the next one? But do you have an example? Yeah, I, th I think we we have some examples. I think at the moment we are we're trying to to launch a few of these uh, these initiatives. Uh, but I think from the past experience, I think it is um, as as Arya was saying, it, it's quite rare. Uh, it is coming in and it's not yet realized. So I think I, I cannot disclose also some of the projects we're working on uh, due to confidentiality, obviously. But but. From the from the past, I can give an example where we have a nature-based solution which was financed in a different way in in the United Kingdom. It was the Becton uh, case where we uh, had a sand engine uh, concept where we had a large volume of sand which which naturally replenished the coastline. Mm -hmm. And the finance was a uh, was sort of a PPP structure where we had public-private uh, funding uh, where a refinery which was at risk behind the coastline was funding. Uh, for the protection, uh, together with the government and, and some local entrepreneurs. I think that that showed that it is possible to attract local finance uh, from the for a coastal <coughs> defense. But what we yeah. see in Africa and other places is that it's very difficult to uh, to make a bankable business case uh, on the protection what's behind that coastline. Okay. So we so, are really looking looking to add value in a green way. Look at the ESG uh, targets. Uh, as you see at the moment, there are a lot of banks who are willing to invest, and they all have uh, demands on, on, on uh, green um, aspects or ESG aspects, uh, which you need to incorporate. So I think I think there's a lot of uh, things going to happen in the coming time uh, to, uh, mm. to to incentivize this. So, so let, let's zoom in a bit on this. Arjan, um, you wrote, or actually you, you already pointed out, you co-wrote uh, the, um, the the report, uh, Finance Sustainable and Marine, or uh, the exact term is uh, Financing Sustainable Marine and Freshwater Infrastructure, right? Yes, correct. Um, so I assume that one of the things that you produced the report for was to identify bottlenecks in this connection between the, um, the world of executing the projects and the world of funding the projects. Um, can you summarize in, in a couple of sentences what the main findings of the report are in that respect? Yeah, sure, I can, uh, Mike. So in, in a nutshell, we identified six main barriers, um, which uh, subsequently are uh, should uh, the joint screening taken along the financial sector for these projects that would be very helpful because they are um, so knowledgeable on these kind of projects. Mm -hmm. Certification of green projects uh, is also very important, uh, particularly the financial sector is very uh, sensitive to uh, reputational uh, risks. Standardization of the packages, uh, standard legal frameworks, um, uh, make these bankable, etc. So uh, standardization in that sense is also one of the barriers that uh, needs to be worked on. Mm -hmm. Policy incentives remain very important. Uh, so the public sector, it's a pity they uh, I don't, didn't see them in the attendance uh, list. No, uh, so we need to we need to make sure they come to Dubai. Yeah, and perhaps also for our next session, uh, insurance industry as a de-risker could also be very helpful. And now we try to focus on getting all the uncertainties uh, uh, right and straighten them out in a technical sense, but you can also de-risk your projects from a financial perspective. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, um, uh, reporting tools, uh, harmonized uh, methods, uh, uh, including all those wider societal benefits into your Cost benefits, evaluations, decision making process, etc. Because now they're often left out. It's all on financial, straightforward, old-fashioned terms. So these are the six main barriers we identified. But 
each of these barriers there's quite a world behind it again like the, in, with this last point you're referring to what is what what is commonly called externalities right yes yes so yeah yeah so um uh, Reinhard, from the point of view of, of of your practice which of these ones are particularly relevant um yeah i, I, I think for for us i think yeah some kind of governance or, or let's say I, I think one of the problems i think at the moment is it making a bankable business case is not taking the the value of nature into uh, into the equation i think that is mm -hmm. that is a very important uh, issue because i think banks if you look at um i was just reading an article this morning uh or let's say investments uh, by the multilaterals so there there's a pledge of the world uh of the un and it was probably will be re re repeated at cop 27 the next week in uh, in egypt there's the world wants to commit 100 billion dollars uh, per year to uh let's say for the climate as mitigation and adaptation and if I see how much money from from currently committed, I think in 2021 it was about 50 billion committed. Only 4 billion is grants, which is very low, and the rest is loans. And loans, uh, let's say they want returns. And if 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 in the equation there's no returns on cash flow on, on the coastline, I mean, mm -hmm. I was saying we had a project in Sali where uh, there was a huge benefit for the fishermen, but we cannot ask these fishermen to put five dollar uh, every time they come in with a fish in a big basket and and uh, give that to the contractor to uh, who has made it. And it's very difficult to get this cash flow into your your on the one side you're creating value, but it's it's not being valued in the equation. So I think I think that is a big hindrance at the moment to uh, to make these bankable business cases. Yeah. So so there is there is um, um, some kind of income that first of all is hard to describe. It's actually hard to capture. Is that is that a correct way of putting it? Yeah. Which, um, and then there, there's no alignment between um, who invests in the project and who benefits from that from that cash which which the project actually produces or, or the value which the project produces. Right. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ayan, um, in your in your report, did you talk to people who are working on on trying to overcome this? Um. In the report, perhaps not so much, but in the wider research uh, has been done, uh, you see a lot of effort in this in this field. And perhaps uh, to reflect on what uh, Reinhardt mentioned and you about the externalities, a lot of the externalities are positive externalities. So um, we all feel that this uh, sustainable uh, approach brings uh, more value to society as a whole. So mm. the whole trick is in trying to uh, uh, capture that uh, value with all kind of perhaps uh, innovative financial mechanisms, cost recovery instruments, etc. And if you look in uh, uh, literature or other sectors, there is a wide set of uh, cost recovery instruments uh, available, but uh, we are quite accustomed, uh, accustomed to using just a few of those. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, charging uh, ships that come into the port or uh, lease tariffs of uh, or terminals, uh, but if you look, for instance, to the uh, public sector, the uh, taxation uh, regimes, if you can, for instance, the, the, the fishermen mentioned by uh, Reinhardt, it's very hard to ask cash from them, but if they bring wider benefits to society, they have an income, huh? they uh, pay their taxes uh, perhaps, or uh, they are not uh, leaning on uh, on other subsidies or something like that, it all could 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 benefit society as a whole. So perhaps the taxation system uh, could be something uh, that's helpful. Could be local taxation, or, and we see these examples. Uh, for instance, in uh, Mexico, the uh, coral reef uh, restoration uh, project uh, there, it 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 um, protects the tourism industry, and the tourism uh, industry has a lot of income, but there's also the taxation, real estate ta taxation, tourism taxation behind it. So. If you keep these uh, coral reefs uh, intact, uh, that brings quite some benefits, but you mm. need to plug into those benefits. Uh, that's where, where we need a lot to do a lot of work. What, what kind of work? Uh, yeah, again, I, it's, it's the core message I, I, I bring everywhere. It's, it's building awareness. These instruments are available, so this is not uh, rocket science. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to show what we can do with these projects. And we do that internally yeah, within our own conference, etc. And everybody is aware of what we can do. But bring this out to the public sector, to the the, uh, the government, the municipalities, to the head, to the clients, to the financial sector, to the investors. Uh, 
It's, it's what we do is, um, I heard a, a prof uh, an expert from the uh, European Investment Bank calling this, uh, people are sea blind. They know a lot what's going on on land, but what's outside there and what we can all do and all the, the, the things that can benefit society as a whole, it's, it's very um, unknown by, by mm. many. Uh, and also important players uh, like the client, like the municipality, cities like. Mm. Okay, so, so is it, is it just a matter of you don't know what you don't know? Well, if, one, if there's one thing we learned from this process of building this report, it's, it's exactly that. When getting into this conversation with, with uh, high level, really professional people, financial sector, telling them uh, from uh, the, the dredging sector and what's there, uh, they mm. asked us, so what is it exactly uh, you do? So uh, is it you dig holes in the uh, sea and seabed? And so th there's a lot, and, and it's not that and these are really uh, are, uh, really smart people and knowing a lot about infrastructure investment in a broad sense and, and pushing money from all the pension funds uh, towards all this infrastructure, mm. but uh, not so much on the, uh, the marine side. Yeah, aside from from uh, wind parks, uh, that. Yeah. So, so Reinhard, wh why do you think you are so unpopular? <laughs> I, I don't know. I think we do. Uh, we need to do a better advertisement, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I, th I think if you if you look at the Netherlands, I think we are very much, let's say, uh, used to defending our lands. We are uh, grown up with uh, climate adaptation. Um, so we have dikes all over the place. So we, we know how it is. to and, and that is not the case in other countries. And I think other countries didn't have that problem before. So it is also creating awareness that sea level rise is coming and, and unavoidable. Um, and we need to do something about it. So I think the urgency is not there. And I am always find it very sad to say, but I think what, when we the business will be generated once there's a big, big disaster. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, and I think um, I don't know what the English saying is uh, of the of the cool of uh, them and the put. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> you, you don't know. That, no, that, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no, that, it's no use oh, crying but, over spilled milk, is the English expression. Oh, okay. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so uh, looking at Pakistan at the moment, big disaster, which is actually more like internal flooding. Him, I think we yeah. are. We are as a dredging company very much focused on the on the, uh, the threat from the sea from the outside, uh, but there's also a big threat from the inside from the rivers, and uh, we also have good examples of that the room for the rivers in the Netherlands, where we can assist. On, uh, but we as a dredging industry are more looking at the uh, at the outside uh, defenses. Because I think defenses. another another phenomenon which is there is that the. Um, um, and from the local government, from a lot of places, they would like to have a solution which is uh, a one-off. So, if we come somewhere uh, and we say we can make uh, we can make a dike out of concrete, uh, giving you a 50 years guarantee, we can calculate it, uh, guaranteed, no maintenance. Uh, we come back in 50 years and then we do uh, the same trick for you again. Mm -hmm. That is, from a local perspective, the way forward. I mean, that is for them easy. They get funding and, 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 and no issues. But looking for a more green solution, like uh, the, the sand engine concept or maybe mangrove restoration, doing some, some other or a coral restoration, that is a more uh, high maintenance solution, which, which mm -hmm. is a bit less predictable. So I think I think from... The insecurity which is in there, I think, is uh, we need to address to, to to get further, I think, because in the end, it will benefit nature and in the end, it will benefit benefit the country as well. Uh, yeah. So, so Arjan, you, you just mentioned as one of the successful examples, um, the project that was carried out in the Netherlands on the Mose River to do flood protection. Would something like that also work in, in Pakistan? Well, uh, it's uh, quite a challenge they, uh, they're having there. Um, but um, one of the big uh, advantages here was that there was a good quality uh, sand and gravel, which could be used in the uh, construction uh, industry. And uh, that's mm -hmm. not always the case. If you uh, have the good quality, then you cannot use this as a revenue uh, a source of revenues. Yeah. On the other hand, if you take it on a broader scale, uh, damage that happens to a country like uh, Pakistan now is bringing uh, 
uh, you can monetize that as well. So you have to find a mechanism to use uh, that. And unfortunately, what we see in, develop, uh, in the developed world, if there's a disaster like this, then economy will grow. Huh? We will all invest again. Huh? We will repair stuff, etc. So we it bring us on a, on a path of growth uh, again, or bring, uh, brings us back on the track. What happens in a lot of countries still in transition uh, is that if there's an event like this, then uh, all systems will go down. And for instance, uh, the food shortages can uh, arise. Uh, farmers will not be able to work on their land, uh, get uh, fertilizer in, uh, bring the uh, crops out, etc. So uh, the, the, the eco economy can go flat. Yeah. Uh, and not recover for quite a few years. And if you calculate the cost of that, that's way bigger uh, than what you would have paid. Uh, these uh, sure. So that's avoiding this, but but cost uh, cost avoidance is something uh, more difficult to uh, finance. Yeah. Typically so this is this is one of those negative externalities, yeah. uh, which actually should be part of the consideration on a, on a broader scale. So so. I, I hear that that is a recurring issue, looking at things from a broader perspective. Um, and let, let's go into that in the second part of this uh, of this seminar, this webinar. Um, I'd like to open the floor for questions, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to do twice a question and answer period with Aryan and, and Reinhardt. So uh, you can ask your questions either by typing them up in the chat box or you can use the raise hand function. Um, in that case, we would invite you, if I give you the opportunity to do so, to identify yourself, open up your uh, your uh, microphone and your camera, and just ask your question directly in the in the broadcast. But feel free to um, to ask your questions in the chat box about this first part, which is mainly about the the underlying reasons for the lack of alignment between the the projects and the world of finance so it's risk aversion it is the absence of joint screening it is there is a lack of certification of projects there's no common legal frameworks um, there's a lack of policy incentives in particularly from the supranational organizations such as world bank and imf um, the role of insurance companies as de-riskers and there is a lack of good reporting tools which would include externalities so I leave you some time to mull that over, and then I'd be looking forward to your first question. No questions so far. Oh, so clear, uh, Mike. Yeah, very clear. Um, well, or. It is so complicated, <laughs> which is also possible, of course, because what, you, what you've been explaining is, um, you know, often the, 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 the point of decision making, which is very much local, um, is not the same point as where the money comes in or where uh, money needs to come from. Um, and that is a big, a big issue. But we have a nice question here from Kathleen DeWitt. Uh, what do you think um, could be done? to help in the de-risking. So what either from your perspective, Ayan, as somebody who is who takes that slightly broader view. Hello, Kathleen. Good morning to you. We see you on the screen now, but thanks for typing up your question. Um, or Reinhardt, from the point of view of, of um, at the dredging companies, what can you do to convince insurers that actually the risk is not as big um, as they think it is? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit broad question, I think. I think it's from which perspective are we looking? Are we looking uh, from the insurer's perspective? Um, what I always find difficult with insurers is they 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 just look at the model. So they they look at the risk which is there currently, and then they're going to provide a premium to the, to the owner. So if I've got a big asset behind the coastline, which is worth maybe 100 million, they say, OK, you pay a premium of maybe 1 million every year. Uh, or maybe more, and 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 that is it. And if we defend the coastline, um, and, and we make it safer, so less risk, then uh, the premiums should go down. Mm -hmm. But the person paying it is the is the owner of the factory. So it is you need to have you're already getting two parties involved uh, to to uh, to discuss how to monetize this money. So I think. That is from an insurance perspective, I think a complicated matter because you would need a guarantee from the insurer. 
to your owner of the product and if if you yeah but let let me interrupt you there because now you're taking the perspective of saying well it's hard to do it but what would be your first step to actually do what you're just describing how can you get into touch with insurance companies and how can you how can you make sure that you do start talking those three parties all together yeah and also more concrete what do we need are we able already to to quantify the risk on one hand and let's say the less risk if we take certain measures because i I, think insurance companies need figures they need statistics they need proof that it helps and so are we already able to actually put numbers on it i I think i think we are but you see that the numbers um let's say you can let's say that for a hard defense it's easy yeah i mean if you uh but you're at uh, you're the prime dc i think so you uh you you probably know how to calculate uh, the risk of uh of flooding but then how to assess the damage caused by the flooding is, is already a different matter but that's insurance companies but i, I would prefer that the, the the insurance companies would take a little bit more proactive role here to to guarantee for maybe 30 years uh, a lower premium uh, and 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 I think we as a as a as a dredging company can help them with with uh, with the designs but I think you as a consultant also but I think we have other consultants in the Netherlands as well who can assess these risks and and and, and start working on the model so I think looking forward to risking would 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 require efforts from the insurance company like Swiss Re, uh, maybe some others as well, and 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 see how we can monetize this money. I think that that will definitely help. Uh, Ion, I saw you yeah, I, not I, non-verbally I, signaling that you would like to contribute to this part of the discussion. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Kathleen, for for your question. I, first of all, I think uh, the next webinar, Christian Wecki from Swiss Re will yeah. uh, be one of the speakers, and he is in an excellent position to to give full insight uh, on this. And I think this is also a very good topic uh, uh, to further explore in uh, Dubai. Uh, but having said that, um, uh, we are often thinking about uh, insurance in terms of uh, risk, uh, in, in, in terms of damages, et cetera. But you can also think about it in terms of uh, uh, performance uncertainty. For instance, if you're thinking about uh, uh, seagrass uh, to help uh, protect a uh, coastline, uh, the performance of that is uh, there's a lot more uncertainty than building a hard concrete wall. And there is certainly a field where the insurance sector uh, could jump into. So how to cover this, uh, this uncertainty instead of uh, the technical sector trying to pinpoint exactly what, uh, what the performance will be, uh, etc. Uh, and actually, um, uh, in this process also of building the report, and you are well aware of that uh, uh, yourself, uh, Kathleen, um, uh, insurance industry, they do have their own uh, departments for analysis, et cetera. And these are first grade top uh, class um, departments or investigation uh, bureau, and they know a lot about this. So I think, and they are um, very much willing to explore the opportunities here. Of course, they are certainly not afraid of risk. That's their business. And they are more than willing to insure it if it's a big, and big risk. Or, uh... mm. now, of course, they're not afraid of risk. They're afraid of having yeah. to pay for risk um, <laughs> yeah. when, when, it, when it actually goes wrong. So, so interestingly, as we observed at the start, um, we don't have any representatives of neither insurance companies or the financial world in today's seminar webinar, right? So. Um, the, 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 that's that's where everything starts. So what, one of the solutions would be: How do we get these? Pe- how do we get to talk to these people? Are you, you, you talked to them um, in, uh, in when you drew up the report with your team? How did you find them? Who were they? <laughs> well, the, that was quite a quite a long process from uh, working groups uh, through the uh, World Economic uh, Economic Forum. There they uh, all come together and they mm-hmm. all uh, try to dig. Out, uh, dive deep into all kind of uh, topics and from there uh, connections uh, start and uh, actually what we noticed that uh, particularly in switzerland there's a close uh, network of all kind of financial players and they all know each other very well and they're very much into this uh, uh, green finance and from there uh, from one context we go to the other and then uh, that's where we started uh, building a group and uh, 
it was fascinating uh, to work with them. Uh, and they also uh, very much uh, offer very closely work, for instance, with European pension funds, et cetera, to focus on infrastructure investment. So, um, yeah, we you have to start somewhere. And perhaps one of the conclusions also in this process was that they uh, they read specific uh, journals, uh, specific uh, literature. Uh, they don't uh, attend uh, conferences, for instance, from IEDC, uh, to mention one. Uh, so we have to publish way more in their journals, in their uh, and, and attend their conferences and, and mm. show off what we're doing over there instead of showing it off to to our well, let's call it uh, in crowd. Mm -hmm. So th that was also something uh, uh, we learned from that. And but we have to fight ourselves in a little bit there as well because you have the competition from other infrastructure uh, sectors who needs uh, who need finance uh, from telecom services to uh, and particularly the energy sector, etc. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, okay. But, uh, so like face face them. Go and go and find them. Literally, actively. Yeah, and don't yeah. don't assume that they're going they're going to read um, your 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 journals um, because again they too don't know what they don't know. Yeah. Right. They, yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe you can ask one question, uh, Kathleen. Was was this the particular de-risking you were looking at? Because there's also de-risking of the project itself. I think there's a different angle, but this was your perspective, right? Or no, I was indeed just asking how can we help them in actually assessing this risk? Yeah. yeah and okay. then yeah. we until now we just talked about insurance companies, but I see also the question from Mark is maybe a bit related to what, what's also been said. Um, that's the, the difficulty is also that sometimes the benefits and the costs follow different paths so the one who has to pay doesn't get the direct benefits of for example a nature-based solution at eh? the sustainability yeah. of the infrastructure you can build two types of infrastructure delivering the same result let's say for flooding eh? flood protection but as nature-based solution might also deliver other results but might be more costly so that's i think one of the other main difficulties that costs and benefits do not go to the same parties and that's yeah yeah i've heard yeah. that in, in in preparing for this this uh, this webinar i've heard that from several parts um, there is a question indeed from mark van geest in the chat box now <clears throat> which is um, addressing nature-based solutions as green gray solutions and if you have any experience with that Arjan or reinald Yeah, I, I, I think that's 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 what we're trying to do now. Eh? I think we we really would like to add more value by giving uh, yeah, green grey infrastructure, looking for nature based uh, solutions, building with nature. Uh, Mark uh, works for Boscanus. Uh, we we are together in EcoShape, which is a platform really together with consultants and government NGOs trying to uh, promote nature based solutions, but also getting the knowledge about uh, what is the risk of a nature-based solution? How can we convince clients? Because what I told you before, I think the local governments are very much on the easy way. They want to, they don't have a lot of, we, we have in Holland, the, the Algeheimraadschap, or the, the, the waterschappen, the water body. Mm -hmm. Water are, boards, yeah. Water boards. Um, so you would need to install these kind of institutions in these countries to manage this, this type of uh, of solutions uh, in the end is, is beneficial for for nature but it's not valued yet so i think one of the things is how can we make a system and i think we touched upon it before uh, it was like a uniform system how to measure added value we were i think iadc worked something out on, on savia which is one of the mm -hmm. systems we sometimes use uh, kpmg true value analysis i think uh, getting that uniform, I think we are currently, we are at the path, uh, we know financially how, how we need to report, that's very clear, dollars, that's, uh, everybody knows that for years. Mm. Now CO2 is coming into the equation, which I think is helping, but we're not yet there that it is a very clear system, and I think once we sort that, we also need to think about biodiversity, and maybe biodiversity credits, or let's say, uh, and, and, and how can we encash on that value, I think that will definitely help on, on getting uh, these green gray projects uh, further uh, mm. and, and, and yeah. Okay, Arjan, anything to add to that? 
Yeah, in line with what uh, Reinhard uh, um, mentioned. Um, what I noticed so far is that many uh, uh, commercial navigation projects have, for instance, related to port authorities. They are, seem to still be quite reluctant or conservative, if you will. They have many issues on their plate, and uh, of course, hey, they want to also push forward in sustainability, but they have so many options to do so, uh, particularly in the energy field, but also think about uh, emissions, uh, air, that kind of stuff. So they have to, uh, they, they they pick their, their topics, uh, uh, emissions, uh, shipping, that is uh, high on their agenda uh, quite often, otherwise uh, energy, uh, or energies. Uh, and then nature-based solutions, solution from the marine, uh, sustainable solution from the marine side, are perhaps not that high on their agenda. And sometimes they do some stuff, but it's not the skill we would like to see. Although they are well positioned to do so, uh, they can derive the um, cost recovery models or provide the value to the, to the wider region. So mm -hmm. I think they are in a good position. Uh, if you could start there, but well, we have to convince them then. Right. So, so let let us let us ask a poll question to uh, the participants in the webinar about that. We've got a third poll question here. If you would be kind enough to uh, to produce that on screen, which is, um, who do you think is mostly responsible for creating greater opportunities for the green financing of sustainable infrastructure, marine and freshwater infrastructure? So again. Uh, in this kind, I'd like you to make one choice as an audience so we get a clear answer of where you think the main responsibility lies, because if you tick all the boxes, then uh, we, we still won't know where to start from. So just take take one, um, pick one, and we can see the, uh, uh, the statistics develop as people respond to this. We've got six responses now, and for now, most people think it is government bodies, but let's wait another bit. So, gentlemen, this is a good, good moment to take a sip of water. Or coffee, yes, sure. Our choice, evidently, because uh, we only have 10 responses so far, or maybe people don't want to commit. So that's interesting because we've got 50% say it's government bodies. We've got a quarter which say it's the clients of dredging services. And then similarly, institutional investors. Nobody thinks it's the consultants. Aryan, you're off the hook. Um, and nobody thinks it's dredging companies, um, which is interesting because we had the majority of our participants are from dredging companies. How How do you... How any either of you can start, Arjen or, or, or Reinhard. What do you think about that result? So we've got we've got the majority of our participants are members of dredging companies, but nobody thinks that it's the dredging company's main responsibility. Uh, I think probably a lot of people work for these dredging companies, and I think uh, we we try, we want to. I think uh, we really have the incentive to 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 bring these nature-based solutions to to think about nature. But the problem for us is is most of the times that our clients are looking at um, at money. So um, if they compare our offer to a Chinese offer, uh, and we add maybe uh, thirty percent of additional value through uh, building with nature, uh, creating biodiversity, or having less impact. And that's not, that's not being, being put into the financial model. So I think for us, we, we want to, and we often offer it as an alternative, but we see that clients are still acting uh, on, on the old way. So I think uh, they're looking at, at, at their cash, uh, what, how much are they gonna spend for this project? And, and, and that is, uh, I think we need to change that mindset, and that mindset is really with with governments and with uh, our clients. So, but I think it's it's dual role. Eh? I think a lot of our clients are governments. Uh, so I think it's the it's the people who are paying for it. They need to change their uh, their game. Mm -hmm. Okay, but how how will they, Ian? Well, if with a few steps back. Uh, Looking at the government as a responsible party, uh, there are efforts uh, going to change the accountancy rules where you include natural capital into the whole evaluation system and, and 
ways of uh, seeing what kind of capital you have in hand. And that will be a real game changer, but that will take a, uh, and then uh, particularly all the clients, uh, they will move more towards that uh, direction. So that's one thing. The other thing uh, is that the, the entire sector is, is very much transactional. So it goes from transaction to transaction. So I was hesitant also a little bit just to, to uh, tick off the box of consultants. So if you can offer an oven ready transaction where you see the whole model, the business uh, uh, case, uh, uh, which is very, uh, which is attractive, uh, then clients uh, looking at their money might move in that direction as well. And I think we got most pieces of the puzzle uh, somewhere, but we need to get this puzzle together. And I uh, noticed from other reports, more from the financial sector, is that for uh, carbon trade, you already see shift, uh, making shifts. And there they see this revenue model. And if you can build this into, let's say, wetland development or something, if that will be uh, achievable, uh, then you can offer this as an oven-ready transaction, and then they will uh, uh, move forward in that direction. But I'm not sure whether uh, we are there yet. So there's a little bit, yeah, two sides I'd like to mention here. Okay, so there there is a government body which is taking quite some action in this respect, which is the European Union, right? You've got the, the European Union Green Deal, you have the taxonomy which they're working on and which should come on stream um, in the foreseeable future. How do you see the impact of that? Well, um, you have the regulatory bodies, uh, which will also make a push. Yeah? Sometimes it's just not allowed to use uh, gray or old fashioned uh, solutions. So but that uh, does not necessarily have to do a lot with financing and business uh, cases, et cetera. It's just pushing, uh, uh, making the regulations more strict. Mm -hmm. um, would you be in favor of that? But let's yeah, let's take yeah, it. Sure, let's take an sure. extreme position. Do you, sure. do you think it's what are what are the solutions is to simply push with 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 um, whether um, supranational authorities or with local authorities to push for a ban on you know the use of certain amounts of concrete? Let, let's just call a, uh, a man a man a spade a spade. Would that be part of the solution? What do you think, Reinhard? Um, no, nah, I, th I think just banning it, I think is a bit too simplified. I think um, I think what I see, but maybe another dimension to this is that the current procurement processes are very much long processes and they are fixed mindset. So they, they, they uh, before any nature-based solution come into play, they already have in their mind, this needs to be it. And then mm -hmm. we have normally come in at tender stage, and then we don't have the room for maneuvering um, in this nature-based solution, uh, introducing carbon crediting. It is, it should be in the process earlier. And that's, I think, where the consultants can play a role definitely, but it is also, it, it is not the consultant determining what, what needs to be done. The client also needs to come uh, come this way. Mm -hmm. so I think in that process, I think uh, consultants can play a, a big role in, in bringing it forward. Uh, okay, Arjen, I, you work I, for a consultancy I, I, firm. I, I could think about a ban, uh, linking this to concrete. So why not have a ban on uh, concrete uh, in the water, which is hostile to uh, marine life? Uh, in many cases, it's so easy to have the surfaces of uh, concrete, uh, making them in a, with a relief, uh, etc., which is accommodating all marine life it doesn't have to cost necessarily uh, uh, anything more or maybe just a very little bit more and then it accommodates all the, the shellfish small fish uh, juvenile fish uh, etc and that can be easily done and is uh, done in in many places uh, but sometimes just out of not having an interest or something at all it's it's not done so perhaps that could be and then it's a little, a little bit smaller than uh, having a ban on concrete in the mm -hmm. Waters, but uh, concrete hostile to uh, in life. Uh, why not? But uh, may, maybe an idea could be that you add some uh, negative impact in, in, in money to it. That you need to pay some tax on, on uh, if you use yeah. Uh, yeah. concrete, which is harmful, and that that will incentivize using uh, more friendly concrete. Because uh, I don't think I don't, don't think we want to. I think we want to incentivize people to come up with alternatives for concrete uh, in a mm -hmm. more green way. And then yeah. you come, yeah. And then you get to one of the the, the barriers also mentioned in the in the report, eh, the, the policy incentives. Eh? You can uh, do it on a hard regulatory way, or you can build an incentives or uh, other ways of doing so. So there are many ways with with policy incentives. 
uh, or regulations you can you can push forward in this. And some things are just, I think, quite easy to do, and you can do it on a bigger scale. So one of the like things a, you like mentioned, a concrete, I love the right. Right. Arjan, earlier on, you, you mentioned we need to go out to talk to the people who make the decisions, for instance, in the financial world or in the world of, of regulatory bodies or with clients. But I know where do you see opportunities for doing that? Sorry? Do, where, where do you see opportunities to talk with, with, with the, the, the decision makers? <clears throat> Yeah, now we we uh, we're attending. Um, next week I'm I'm going to uh, to Egypt to uh, to COP27. Uh, that's where we want to uh, see how we can let's say talk to uh, to these government bodies on the UN level. Uh, let's mm. say show that we are willing and we have methods, but but you know, how how can we together do this? Um, and further, we we were talking to clients. We're talking to uh, we're trying for partnering uh, to to bring the discussion a bit broader than what it is, because we cannot do this alone. I think it's a joint effort. I think we have a world problem here which needs to be addressed. Um, so yeah, it, it, it requires some, um, how to call it, somebody taking the lead here. Um, so we, 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 we try to tell our story, what we want to do uh, and what we can bring to the table. Uh, which is of course, which is of course SDG 17, which is that the sustainable solutions will only materialize if you work together with uh, with all the stakeholders involved. Yeah. Um, let's see if we have any further questions from from our participants for our second Q and A period. Um, again, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to ask your questions, feel free to either type them up in the chat box or to raise your hand with the appropriate icon. Um, under reactions on your screen. Let's wait a bit. It took a bit of time for the first question to come through earlier on. Otherwise, I'll have some more questions for you. Okay, so let, let, let me ask you, the two of you, a different kind of question. The, the second webinar we're going to have is going to be on the 23rd of November, and we will have one representative of, uh, of um, a reinsurance company, Swiss Re. You mentioned it already, Reinhard, Christian Wettli. Um, and then we're going to have a representative of investment funds. Um, what would be the things that you would like them to discuss? What would you like to hear from them? Shall I? There you go. Well, well um, uh, the person from the investment company, uh, Paolo Alemani, uh, that will be from the uh, Capital Partners, and mm -hmm. their bread and butter in their company is uh, bringing uh, the finance into infrastructure projects. So they know a lot about the entire sector and where they can, uh, where the money can flow. Uh, so I would be interesting to hear from him. So how we can seduce these. Uh, these investors, uh, pension funds, etc., to bring their money to this uh, promising land of sustainable uh, green freshwater infrastructure. Because it's, if, if you look at it in a, in a broad sense, it's so promising. It touches upon a big, uh, many big problems in the world. Uh, a lot of work needs to be done. It can be done in a green way. Mm -hmm. It's a growing market. Uh, so there, there are so many good things, and yet uh, it's don't seem to to get them really into this. So my question to him will be: So how can we seduce them a little bit? Well, we, well let, let me let me let me be the devil's advocate here because I think the answer is relatively simple. He will say your risks are too high and your returns are too low. Yeah. Your returns are unclear. So why why would I want to invest in your in your projects? Well, we have to wait to see whether the, uh, that is his answer. Um, because the, um, they are very much seeking for green uh, infrastructure. And if mm -hmm. we talk, uh, for instance, with another conversation with the EBRD, they, they are only looking at green uh, infrastructure projects, but they say the only thing we are getting is energy, energy, energy projects. Uh, we want to see other kinds of infrastructure projects because the portfolio is tilting way too much towards the energy sector, although they are, uh, uh, they are there for infrastructure in a broad sense. So 
the one that could bring green projects from another infrastructure part aside from energy could be doing uh, good business there. But of course, uh, we got a lot of homework to do in terms of uh, complexity, uh, etc. Because if you see other responses from the financial uh, sector, um, I think one of the good things we do is make all projects tailor-made, uh, etc., uh, specific to, to, to the context they're in, but uh, it's not really helping us from the financial side because it's not so much recognizable as a asset class or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they've seen it. They know this. Oh, this is, uh, brother, uh, this is just a common thing. We can repeat this. We can replicate this. So uh, there's still work to be done, but I think these issues can be... Uh, Resolved. Reinhard, do you think would this be a task for IADC to establish uh, the, the sustainable marine and freshwater infrastructure projects as an attractive asset class? Or who, who, who should need to tell that story in a consistent yeah. way and, and reduce that complexity? And I think IADC can definitely help, I think, uh, of, of telling that story. I'm just thinking also about another dimension on the uh, if, if, if you look at the, the financing, I think um, the, the bankable business case, what we before said, I think on the one side, you need this additional value, which which I think IADC can help on, on the SEVI of promoting a standardized system to, to make that worth value. And then also for the investors to see that the revenue stream can come out of there. The other thing is, I think, uh, the access to grants. Uh, we typically see that grants are, are pretty uh, difficult to get, uh, mm -hmm. take a lot of time, uh, take years to come. Um, and also a private party is, is not part of the equation. So uh, typically multilaterals don't talk to, uh, to contractors, they want to talk uh, government to government. So mm -hmm. if you want to bring in new solutions to the table um, of project developments, I think, I think the, 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 we, we should invite also the multilaterals like the World Bank to join this, this table uh, and, and start seeing how we can together, uh, let's say, tackle this problem. Right. I'm, I'm always thinking about how, how we tackled the problem when we had an issue in the Netherlands in 1953. I think it was uh, when, when, when there was a big flood, a lot of people died. Uh, we said, well, now we have an issue. Now we're going to fix it. And then we, the government took uh, the, the action and, and, and formed teams, brought in finance, uh, brought in the, the, the consultants, brought in the contractors. Everybody was sitting together and made some kind of a task force and, and made a big plan to, to, uh, to, make, to make Netherlands resilient again. And I think that type of concept could be something I think uh, we, we could do on a higher level as well. But then the UN or, or somebody who, who made these pledges of 100 billion should take the, 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 the lead into it. And then private sector can play a role and private investment as well. But, but mm. you, need, you need a little bit of grant money as well to, to make this worth. And then if you look from a holistic point of view, now I'm preaching a bit that, that the, uh, it's the Western world who, who made the mess, or let's say who created the, uh, the, the environment that sea level rise is happening. And, and countries who didn't contribute that much are suffering from it so there's yeah. a bit of yeah responsibility yeah. from the western world and therefore to, to take, yeah. to take, yeah. uh, take the lead here yeah so um, interestingly even though this wasn't planned ladies and gentlemen Reinhard, you've set up um, very well um, the kind of environment for for the kind of environment we're going to create um, at the conference in Dubai, uh, which is going to take place on the 9th of February. For, so for all of you who are interested in developing these thoughts further, that is exactly what we're going to do at the conference. We're going to bring all of the stakeholders together. We're going to create a situation where all of those will be on stage, will be talking to one another, will conducting the kind of discussion which we, in a limited way, conducted uh, the, 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 the three of us with some outside help today. There, everybody will be present all of the stakeholders, and we're going to see how far we can get with them to work out the solutions for deblocking this kind of stalemate, which is uh, which is currently um, still keeping the world of uh, marine and freshwater infrastructure projects in its grips. Um, we have reached the end of this uh, of this webinar. I'd like to very thank many thanks to. Uh, Arjan and Reinhardt, and uh, here is the slide with the information for the conference in Dubai, ladies and gentlemen. Sign it up in your diary, and we hope to see you there um, in 
about two or three months from now. Thank you for your presence today and uh, also join on the 23rd of November when you have the representatives of financial institutions joining us for the second webinar. Goodbye for today.